This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. A friend and mentor of C.C. Lee said the spirit encouraged him to inspire C.C. to write a book about his life. He said it was so extraordinary. He had to share it with the rest of the world. It is entitled Snippets of My Life, and when I caught up with C.C., he was in a Beaumont, Texas restaurant waiting for a group of missionaries be advised, there is some sexual content in this interview. Now, in your book, you describe what happens when you learn about sex at too young of an age. Explain that. Ooh, well, in the book, you know, it starts out at me at five years, six years old, being in, in the bushes, and you know, and, and by the older cousin, and I'm like, uh, you know, well, she ain't got a wee wee, so I'm kind of like, okay. Ever, and then after that, at ten years old, I was taught how to do oral sex it just escalated from there and it was all kind of escapades you know growing up and when i was in the navy there was all kind of crazy stuff there and there was uh, an abuse but it was from a older guy in school and i did not like it but uh, as, as far as when i was 10 and i wasn't really forced i was taught I enjoyed it. And so, so I don't want to say it's abuse because they were underage themselves. You know what I mean? And so it wasn't, it wasn't that way. Nobody knew nothing, you know, no, you know, we just kids, cousins and all of us, I got outside playing and doing things and together and all that, you know, it's just, it wasn't like today, you know, nowadays, you know, everybody's, you know, drop of a hat, you know, back then it was, it seemed like it was a natural thing. I think this is like the mid sixties, late sixties, you know, so you end up going into the Navy and... And I did more drugs. And uh, they got strict back in the 80s whenever I, I was in there. And I was using my roommate's urine to pass the piss test. Oh, boy. And then uh, when I left the Navy, I uh, I met uh, this girl. And I didn't know she was uh, bisexual until later on. But uh, she found out that I could perform oral sex just as good as a female. So she kind of fell in love with me. So we, you know, got married and uh, it went good for a while, but uh, we started this party, party, party all the time, party, party, party. And it just, she had three abortions while we was together. She didn't want to have no kids and caught her cheating. Did not cheat on her. It's, that's why I say it's snippets in my life. It's a lot of stuff that went on in my life that's in the book, you know. And then you end up going to prison. After I, I left her, I had gotten clean and sober and started going to NAAA. I got really involved in everything else. And I went back to college and I became an LVN nurse. And then I, I committed my crime. The The charge was called aggravated sexual assault. Okay. But it, what it was, was I, I performed oral sex on two minors. One of them was precocious and, and, and I knew better. It was my choice. I, I, I could easily say no, but there was insinuating circumstances that, that led up to that. I'm not a, I'm not a pedophile. I don't go looking for that at all. It just happened one time thing and I made a mistake. How long did you have to stay in prison? Well, I was out of town in this, in this little country hick town called Hempill. And I got this new court-appointed lawyer, didn't know nothing. He says, if you go to court, you're going to get 60 years. He says, if you sign this 40 years here, you only do 10, 12, and be out. You know, and I'm, I've been praying and crying. And, and, and so, you know, I don't, I've never watched Law and Order or anything like that. So I went ahead and signed. And then whenever I got to the system, that's when I found out that I had to do 20 flat. So you were in prison for 25 years? 23. Yep, 23. How long have you been out? Uh, three years. I, I got I got my first parole. I didn't do nothing wrong. Even even my parole officer, everybody says, you got too much time for this. I said, well, you know, hey, at the time, back in the 96, they built a bunch of new prisons in Texas, and Governor Bush wanted to fill them up. And that was part of the thing right there, too, you know. So what's the point of this book? What's the message? I want to show that things could happen to you. Bad stuff can happen to you, things, you know, that you could be forgiven for and that you can change. Once I got out, you know, I mean, I had good support while I was in prison from friends, family and friends. And when I got out, I started at the bottom. I, nobody hired feeling, you know, jack in the box, you know, and so I, that's where I started. And now, you know, I've got my CDL. I've got, you know, I've got a good job. I've, I'm a priesthood inside my church, you know. Uh, I'm meeting uh, the six missionaries that fix to come to lunch. They're, they're not here yet, but uh, I always love taking them out to eat because, they're, they're wonderful guys. They go out there knocking on them doors and bringing God's message to them. And if, if I can find God in all this and, you know, be forgiven, I think other people can too. I'm, don't get me wrong. If it sells, it's great. If it doesn't, you know, hey, I published a book, you know, here's my story, here's my life, you know. And, you know, if, if it can help just one person change and be different and do better, then that's great. Well, I can't think of a better reason to write a book. Thank you, Cece. 
Kitty Wall worked in accounting at Lockheed Martin, where she met her husband, David, a mechanical engineer. Life was really good until she noticed he was having memory issues that took her down a long and frustrating road that she documents in her book, Dementia. So we went to the doctor, they did some tests, and they still couldn't find out anything because they didn't have anything to match it up to. But uh, it ended up with Parkinson's disease with the dementia. That is one of the side effects of all the different types of disease is dementia. Dementia, what I understand, is not a disease. It's a symptom of some of these diseases. And the psychologist, he looked at David and he had the stone face. No smiling, nothing, no emotion. That was where he detected that uh, he had Parkinson's. It was very difficult. I had no family there with me. So I was, we were pretty well on our own. So we had to do a lot of different things and, and learn. That's one of the main reasons I wrote the book is because through the time I was going through with my husband, you learn new products learn how to take care of your loved one so they're safe. I went through a lot of different books. I, you know, it was giving me scientific stuff. And um, I needed something right to the point. What do I do next? And what do I use? And I made up a chart in there, a daily chart for the caregiver everything I wanted them to do from the time they got David up, from the time he went to bed at night. Uh, He was uh, 65. So I ended up retiring and taking care of him. I was his caregiver for, God, almost nine years. And uh, it's it's very, very hard. And I, uh, I, the caregivers are wonderful people. I, I can't even describe the word that they do for people. And uh, our caregivers were part of our family. But anyway, I the book is, is, it's a book that I wish I would have had. And that's why it's not a big book. It gets right to the point. The words are large, so people can read them. You're not having to get a magnifying glass like they're little ants. <laughs> okay. There's in reference to legal matters, what to do, what to prepare for. Starts from the very beginning. All the products that we use. Tranquility was a fantastic product. It's a brief that holds a court. The, their product is fantastic. They stood by my book. Uh, they uh, advertised for me. There's some other products in there that I use that work. I, I'm trying to help other people for what I went through. Did it help you to kind of get through the grief of losing him by writing this book? Yes, it. it but it hurt big time. It was very, very difficult to sit down and go back in your mind all the things that you went through, uh, and it hurt. It's terrible what dementia does. I mean, it, it takes away your memory. You don't know anybody. And my heart goes out to anyone that's going through that. And that's the main reason I wrote the book is to help others for what you're going through, uh, how to keep them going, uh, you know, games, uh, keep their mind active so they're not wandering around in the night. I had a GPS on him because he took off on me several times. Uh, And I also put in there where, uh, you know, part of anything of the book, it goes to... uh, uh, charity, which is Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So part of the book is going into that, okay, to to help uh, to get rid of it. It's a monster. This thing that with dementia, it's a monster. It really is. Unfortunately, so many people can relate to what you've gone through, Kitty. And um, thank you for writing this book. Gina Clare has been writing since she was four years old, and now at the age of 17, she's published her first book entitled A Fairy's Wish and proven to herself that dreams really do come true. So I remember reading books when I was little and thinking, I can write a book like this. 
but I kind of wanted to write a fairy tale. And I remember reading when I was about nine years old, I read Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine and thinking, you know, fairy tales aren't just for little kids. Fairy tales can be for, you know, older girls too. So I, I always wanted to write a fairy tale. So when I was 13, I, I did it. I actually wasn't really going to finish it, but my mom encouraged me to. I'm glad she did, but I finally got the idea, and I had to um, stop kind of in the middle and take a break for a while. But I came back to it, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to finish this. Why not? Good for you. What's it about? It is about a girl named Gracie. She's about 12 years old, and um, she goes out to her garden one night her, um, while she's home by herself. And she finds out that her garden is inhabited by garden fairies. And um, she finds a fairy in her garden about her own age named Dilly. And it's Dilly's birthday. So she has received 30 wishes as a, as a birthday present. And she says she's going to use one wish to turn Gracie into a fairy. So Grace can be a fairy in her garden and spend time with the garden fairies. And Dilly says, whenever you're ready to turn back into a human, I'll just use another wish and you can do a human. It's that easy. But it doesn't turn out to be that easy. Dilly, later in the day, she gets punished for something, and she gets her wishes taken away from her. So the story is about Gracie um, trying to find out how to turn back into a human, because later the garden begins to die because Gracie's not there watering it. And she finds out that it's up to her to save the garden, so she has to find a way to turn back into a human. And that's, that's what it's about. It's about perseverance. And Dilly work together, and Gracie finds out that it has to be mostly her job. Um, that's the rules of fairy magic, because she is one who turned into a fairy. She has to be the one to save the garden. So it's mostly her job, but um, it's about even though you need to persevere and um, you still can help, uh, your friends can help you, it's good to have friends and, and for teamwork, uh, to do things together. That's, you know, we're strongest when we're together. And you have to keep knocking on doors, right? And no matter how many clothes in your face, you have to keep going. Exactly, because there are times when it seems like, you know, she thinks, I'm never going to turn back into a human. You know, I I'm never going to get to save this garden. But she and her friend Dilly and all the other fairies in the garden continually encourage her. And, you know, she doesn't give up. You know, you just can't give up. That's what it's about. Thinking about writing a sequel, right now I'm working on a kind of a companion book to A Fairy's Wish, but I'm not going to give too much information to let that be a surprise for the future. It's very likely that I'll write a sequel to it in the future, or a prequel, maybe. Do people at your school know that you've written this book? Well, actually, I'm homeschooled, so my brother is my only classmate, but yes, ma'am, he knows about it, and my friends, I've told some of my friends about it, so they know about it, too. I've had lots of encouraging friends and family members who have really been helpful in the process of getting this published. But I'm very hopeful this summer to go out to our local library and teach a class about it and, you know, introduce myself and how I've written this book and teach a class that, you know, teaching other kids and um, adults even, you know, just you can write a book. So I want to, that's a way of publicity I'm hoping to do to introduce myself and, you know, teach a class about writing for kids and adults. I also have an Instagram page about my book, so that's another publicity, uh, form of publicity I'm using, but um, I also hope to have a book signing one day. That's kind of a dream of mine, but I've learned that dreams can come true. Uh, you know, when I first wrote A Fairy's Wish, you know, it was just one of the many stories I kind of casually started writing on my laptop. I never in a million years thought of it being a published book. Um, you know, publishing a book was one of the things that, you know, you, you kind of like to dream about, but you don't think it's ever going to happen, you know? It is amazing. It, the, the first time I got the actual copy of my book, it was on my 16th birthday, so that worked out perfectly. And just seeing that, um, and my mom took a picture of me holding two copies of my book, and I was just smiling so big. It's just, it's just an amazing feeling, that's for sure. Good for you, Jenna. And I'll tell you what, it feels that way at any age. All right, we got to take a quick break, but we're coming right back. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Attention all authors. Page Publishing is looking for authors. 
Have you written a book and want to get it published? Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, Apple iTunes, and other outlets. They handle all aspects of the publishing process for you. Printing, cover art, publicity, copyright, and editing. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. That's 800-204-6099 for your free author submission kit. We're back on the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. A former music professor, singer, and conductor, Bruce Langford retired in Claremont, California. Having always been a writer, once he found the time, he combined philosophy, entertainment, and morality in Conscious, Book One, the island. He found inspiration in a magical place called Orcas Island. Sounds like a place I want to visit. So Orcas Island is, is up in the Washington Sound. It's so far north uh, that it's it's just barely in the country. It's actually north of some parts of the Canadian border. So I went to visit some friends up in, up in Orcas and I'm just walking along, minding my own business. And I, I come to this incredible bay and there's this four or five story tall rock wall that's totally covered by vines and being eaten by the forest. It looked like um, it looked like a set piece out of Indiana Jones. Well, it turns out it was an old lime kiln. So they used to they used to mine lime on, on Orcas and they'd ship it over to the mainland, so on and so forth. So I started reading about it and, and being interested in the history of the island. So on the surface, the story is about a guy who who retires and goes through the requisite uh, existential crisis, moves to the island, and um, within fairly short order, uh, starts hearing music uh, in the forest at night for which he can find no source. Um, he sees a lady who, who raised him and died 20 years ago. She's working in the local bookstore. And eventually he encounters the, the woman who is the source of the music who has lived on the island uh, some two or three hundred years, although is still remarkably uh, uh, good looking for, for, for being 300 years old. It is, after all, fiction. And then finds out that she has inadvertently trapped time in this lime kiln. And her job is to is to release it before it releases itself uh, somewhat destructively. So that's. That's the surface of the story. That's the, you know, that's the plot that keeps it going. But underneath all of that is what I think are really the, the, only, three, the only three issues that matter. Where did we come from? Where are we going? And what are we supposed to do in between? And, and it deals also with issues of free will, as a matter of fact. So it's really what I, what I hope I've created is something that's, Historical fiction, because all of the everything that happens in the book is accurate to people who, well, obviously not everything, but the people who have come to the island, the people who are there, all of the historical things that I write about really did happen. So it's part historical fiction, part philosophy, uh, and part magical realism. And what I hope it is in the big picture is a morality play that, you know, has an entertaining magical realism story to it but underneath really deals with issues that matter. Well, I mean, you say that, you know, he's drawn to this Eleuthera. Is is this the woman that's like 300 years old? Yes. And and he has to make a choice. He, yes. And the choice is, do I believe this craziness or not? So so he's there and, and Eleutheria comes and says, okay, here's who I am. Here's how long I've been here. Here's how this happened. Here's how time got trapped. Here's what you're seeing. You can either stay and help me or you can run and hide. And so his, his choice is, do I buy into this story uh, or, or don't I? And it's, it, it, you know, it's playing with the reader, saying to the reader, you want to buy into this story for the sake of entertainment and for the sake of exploring philosophy or don't you? And of course, you hope that the reader buys in. Uh, as the as the as the hero does. Well, I mean, I would imagine if you buy into it, the story could go on for quite some time, right? Oh, and it does. As a matter of fact, and thank you for asking. It's it's conscious is really part of a trilogy, so it's it's a three book series uh, of which conscious is the uh, is the first one, and then it's followed with chopping water, which is uh, take off on a Zen saying, and then finishes with dragon. So. Yes, it, it does go on for a while. Um, and I, I also think it's important 
no matter what book you're reading, who's telling the story because the information the reader gets is filtered through whoever is doing the writing. So in the first book, the, the story is being told by William, who, who retires and moves to the island and encounters all these things. But as you move through the books, other people start telling the story. And so that makes a difference in the information that the reader gets. Bruce-Langford.com sort of promotes the books and, and posts uh, information. So that's the, that's the go-to. And then, of course, Bruce-Langford.com links to Amazon as the entire world links to Amazon. So um, so that's that's the main way of promoting it. All right, Bruce, thank you. Robert Maiden is known as a storyteller at home in Houston, and his talent came into play when he was with his family in the hospital after his sister had an accident. No one knew what to say, and it was one of those moments when somebody had to say something, and so he did, and then he wrote it down. The name of his book? All for her. Well, it's all about a gentleman who uh, makes a deal with a, uh, well, let's just say what it is, death. And in this story, death plays no part in, in lives. But what if he could actually have an opportunity to have fun, so to speak? So he makes a deal with him. And it's all for the uh, young lady that he loves, or he's about to ask to marry him. And because she, she's involved in an accident. And he makes a deal with death so that he won't lose her? Correct. And, of course, there are several different rules that are written uh, that uh, he can never do. But uh, one in particular, he just goes on an adventure, just appeasing death's wishes in order to keep the young lady alive. What kind of wishes? Uh, For an example, you know, any time that he whispers or says something into them, uh, then that means it releases death to do what he wants to do, and nobody's the wiser. So like what? Uh, can rip a person's heart out of their chest, and nobody sees it. They just see it as a normal heart attack. But uh, it's just doing whatever he wants to do with the person. So death is really, in this story, a deliverer. You know, once a person passes on, they deliver from A to Z, you know, wherever that destination is. And uh, it, it just, for example, all he's doing is just having fun making that happen so he makes this deal is he ever able to get out of it well that would be the end of the story which let's just say there's always a continuation for something so uh that's the part that uh leaves it open does his loved one realize the sacrifice that he's made for her absolutely not because that's part of the rules he can't tell anybody it uh it has a very twisted ending i play on a lot of the things that people have heard for an example, death doesn't play fair. Death is always there. You know, don't mess with death. And, you know, uh, just don't cross paths. Our character, he loses himself on the way. I mean, he has no feelings whatsoever. As time goes on, he can't age. So he is a constant a puppet for the puppet master. And one of the things, for instance, when he's in kind of the beginning of the chapters he comes next to his young lady who is now miraculously healed has nothing wrong with her and he can't get next to her without her having some uh problems she can't keep her food down and so that is in his own right death which of course he in his normal form says his name is joe tells him that any time that he's touched somebody uh other people have this horrible feeling come to them so they don't act the same so it's a touch of death so he becomes like a pariah yes and uh unfortunately death has convinced him that he cannot be with his lady friend unless she just loses her lunch every time he comes around so that's why the two can no longer be together oh geez what a story the message to be honest with you is more of uh you know accept what's there make the most of it and just enjoy well, I mean, she, she was dying. He was going to lose her. Correct. And he thought the deal was sent, you know, a, a great deal. I mean, he had to convince him that death is real. And thus, it's more of a, a curse, you know, to him. So he has to go out and do these things uh, just to keep the one that he knows he loves. Because like I said, he loses his feelings as time goes on. And uh, everything at the end is revealed. 
That's what it was all about. All right, Robert. Nice job. A collection of 17 short stories written over about 15 years, Petrification by Reggie David, takes the reader on a wild ride with Beelzebub, the hero, through afterlife sequences for different kinds of people to Albert Einstein speaking to a guy in the future through a time warp screen. I mean, what else do we find? I just took the demon Beelzebub and separated it from, you know, Lucifer and then just imagined hell and hell being commanded by demons, Beelzebub being the second in command, doing Lucifer's bidding. Some of it's funny. Uh, Worse than Kitsch is a big fat guy that's stomping on little kids' sandwiches and paradising cheap products that are sold. What's morbidity about? It's about a man that is envisioning really morbid things and he keeps on waking up and then going back into his sleeping cycle and then at the end of it he realizes that he's been sleeping all day and that he has just made his way through his business day and he feels very morbid the afterlife is a a different afterlife sequence for certain types of people yeah there's the person that will never go anywhere and they end up at the bottom of an endless staircase where they can't get anywhere. There's the tenement, tenement house man who lives in a morbid, stark environment, and he can never remember what day it is or what date it is. Is there a story that stands out for you? I guess petrification is my favorite among them. Petrification is a man in the middle of the desert who contracts a space virus from cactus-like plants that are in the middle of the desert where nobody goes, and he becomes petrified. And you know how they say brain activity can take, can last for 30 seconds or more after a person dies? I mean, 30 minutes? Well, his brain activity lasts for 30 days. And and he goes through all of these scenes as he's... um dreaming this when he dies. Wow. Reggie, you have some imagination. I have to hand it to you. Huh. Thank you. (laughs) Kind of reminds me of the Twilight Zone, Reggie. (laughs) Thanks so much. Listen, we had a lot of inspiration on this show. How about that 17-year-old getting her first book published and talking about how it feels so good? You can feel it too. Start writing and keep listening to the Page Publishing Book Club in person or by podcast at 710WOR.com. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini. Catch you next time.